do the pledge of allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And then if we could take the roll call, please. Commissioner Cadwalder is absent. Commissioner Carney is absent. Commissioner Zanstra is absent. Commissioner Gerard. Here. Commissioner Salzuto. Here. And Chair Hanley. Here. So seeing we do not have a quorum, we will go ahead and continue with our meeting as uh, discussion only. We will record it for the sake of the public in uh, case anyone has any questions. So we will not move to approve the agenda as we're unable to do that. But um, we can talk about any business here that's in the packet, jumping right down to item six. Is that correct, Mark? Is that what we Yeah, you might, you might open it up for public comment if there's anybody that does want to okay. speak. So I'll open it up for public comment. Concerning items not in the agenda, sir, if you would please state your name and address. Yes, uh, Jim Hodges, 422 North Jefferson Street. Uh, two weeks ago, the uh, city had a uh, consultant, uh, Peter uh, Luxman, uh, attended uh, a brand of special meeting uh, for how to conduct meetings. And uh, in there he had a couple of points of interest that uh, would uh, probably interest the Planning Commission, and that was that uh, uh, as you guys are, uh, as planning commissioners are, as well as city council, sworn into your uh, office. Uh, we don't always do that with all of our other boards and commissions, but we didn't used to, we will be. <laughs> and uh, so we were set straight on, uh, corrected on, on that, as well as uh, the taking of minutes and how to run a meeting, but also of having rules and procedures and uh, how that might go about. So. I would uh, foresee in the uh, near future that uh, perhaps with some uh, staff recommendations and so on that that would be a direction that uh, all of our boards and commissions uh, should uh, uh, make an effort at doing. It uh, sets a uh, uh, decorum for the various meetings, uh, uh, peop uh, the, the power of the chair uh, and how the, the uh, meeting would, would operate. But anyway, it's, it, it's a very good piece. And, uh, uh, that will be shared with you, I think, in, in the near future. But uh, this particular uh, meeting was open to our friends from the townships as well as all boards and commissions. It was a nice small turnout, and uh, uh, Peter was very informative in, in what he had, had to share. So I just thought I'd share that with you. Thank you. Any other public comments? Seeing none, we can move down to uh, the new business items here, redevelopment, liquor license approval process. Yes, you'll see in your packet, uh, it says at the top of page, City of Bowl, redevelopment, liquor license approval process. Um, just to give you a little bit of um, a background, um, redevelopment liquor license are, are licenses that are allowed by the state within certain zones. Um, one of those zones would be a downtown development district, and the city of Lola has a downtown development district, so um, there is some eligibility for these licenses. There, it, there, if somebody's going to request the license, there are certain requirements that need to be met, not only at the state level under, under state law, um, but um, we have the ability to to some extent, and I don't know what extent that is, but to some extent say that um, you also have to meet some of our local, certainly our local codes and, and local zoning would have to be met. Um, we had a request for um, one of these. We, we have two of them in the city of Bowl, one at uh, Black River Grill and the second one at Main Street Barbecue. Um, my understanding is that um, when the one for Flat River Grill was approved or when it went through the process, the law was a little bit different in terms of what steps were required to, to be taken. And, and I haven't gone back to verify this, but I was told that it went through the DDA and the DDA maybe made a recommendation to the council and then the council approved it. Or, so there's some DDA involvement in it. Um, as the next one came before us about a year ago, 
Um, we the law doesn't require any DEA approval, so we took it directly to the city council. And there were some um, folks that were concerned not only about the development of liquor license, but also you know what is the process for this, and and, and how do you walk this through um, city government with with you know, by maximizing transparency and, and allowing for a maximum public input. And uh, we didn't have a process in, in place, but I took those comments after that license was approved, I took those comments to heart and um, talked with some of my colleagues in other areas and, and actually much of what you see in front of you is um, taken from City of Brighton. And uh, they're, um, what I found out, uh, are ones, uh, a municipality in the state that really has worked very hard on this and, and really has uh, um, put together a pretty decent process. So we plagiarized quite a bit from that, um, but then inserted some local things as, as well to, to make it our own. And um, what I've done then is uh, put together this draft process. I've had a discussion with the DEA about it. My discussion with the DEA, it was, do, do you want these coming to you for approval? Um, because you have this balance of, we, we want to be open for business. We want this community, we want this city to be open for business and we want to make it as easy as possible um, for somebody to start a business here. And, and part of that for a restaurant business is getting a redevelopment liquor license. Or um, you know, the other side is that you certainly want maximum public input you want maximum transparency in the process, and, and so you've got to find a balance between the two. And the DDA said, we really don't, you know, we don't feel that it needs to come before us for quote unquote approval, but if you can insert into the process that DDA members are notified that this application has come in, um, then that would be sufficient for us. And um, so we did that, and I'm going to go over where that is in here, but we've also added notification to the Planning Commission, and, and that's why I'm talking to you today, because I, I wanted to make sure that, because there can be some zoning issues that we're working on on the staff, I wanted there to be notification to you, so that um, if you had any questions or had any input that you wanted to give us at a staff level before we um, took it to the council, or even if you wanted to know that it was coming to a council meeting and you wanted to appear before the council, and you know, under public comment um, and, and voice any concerns or any support that you might have for them. Um, so we inserted that into the process. So basically, um, the way this is laid out is, number one is basically the application comes in, uh, comes into the police department. Um, number two is the police department forwards it to the city clerk. Um, three is that the city clerk basically verifies that the application meets the requirements of the statute. That meet, it meets the requirements of state law. Four is that it meets local requirements, and, and I'm going to go into those in a little bit more detail. Um, 4A um, would be, first of all, is the is the request and the location of the request that's a use permitted by right, and does the application meet all the requirements of the city of Wall zoning ordinance? Um, if it doesn't, that raises a flag for us to be able to say to the applicant, before we move forward with this, you may need to go through these steps with the planning commission, or there may be a variance required, or you know, whatever that might be, and so that gives us the ability to notify them at the front end of the process. Um, B is a request is supported by the master plan, uh, downtown development for, uh, authority development plan, or any other development guides applicable to the development district. Um, so it, it meets with our local plans as well. So not only does it meet with our code of ordinances, but it meets with our local plans. Um, C is there's no uh, outstanding code violations, um, and D is that uh, there are no outstanding um, taxes or uh, debts um, uh, to the city. Uh, five then is this notification, once, once the clerk has gone through and verified that yeah, it meets the local requirements, it meets the state requirements, we're going to now um, let the police department know that they can begin with their internal investigation. They have to do a, an investigation as well with, with this applicant. Um, but before we turn it over to the police, we notify, that's when we would notify the DEA and the planning commission. So that's where we've inserted you into the process. So you know that this thing may be coming. Police department proceeds with its investigation recommendations. That's one of the state law requirements, and that's a process they need to go through. 
Um, we also added at a local level, the police department will be notifying the current liquor license holders that um, would receive this application. And I'm going to come back to this, just to make sort of a mental footnote, but there's, there's, a, um, there's a discussion that we will need to have, a policy discussion that we will need to have about the various types of licenses that are, that are available and what that does in terms of competition um, within, within the business or within the industry. I'm going to come back to that, but okay. we've inserted um, where we would notify the current license holders that we have an application pending. Um, there's an approval form that uh, has to be drafted, so the city clerk would have to do that. Um, the city assessor has to uh, create an affidavit of public and private investment that's required under the state law. And basically, the, uh, the assessor is saying that there's been X amount of public and private investment within the district within the last X number of years. That's important because we have available to us under the statute one license for every $200,000 of investment within the district, both public and private. So, for example, the $11 million King Milling project within the DDA district, that qualifies us for 55 licenses, um, just that one project. Um, the street project and, and the, the water mines that we're doing right now on um, Washington, Jefferson, and Jackson, that's a couple hundred thousand. That's one license right there. Um, so there will be a number of licenses that will be um, available within, within the district. And again, I'm going to come back to that conversation. Um, but the assessor has to at least sign an affidavit saying that this is how much investment has been conducted within the district. Um, item number 10 is that the clerk um, has to sign an affidavit just attesting that uh, we created a DDA district, that the proposed location is within the DDA district, and that um, I received the affidavit of public and private investment, and, uh, and I certify that that information is correct. 11 is all of this stuff comes together, um, comes to the city manager, and the city manager then schedules it for a council meeting and to be placed on a, on a council agenda. Um, 12 is the applicant has advised of the date of the council meeting, when the item will be on the agenda. Um, 13 is the city council uh, review. And um, one thing that I should note is that this is not a approval or denial at a local level, it's a recommend or does not recommend. The applicant, even if the city council voted to not recommend a license, the applicant can still take all this material and take it to the Liquor Control Commission, and then the Liquor Control Commission ultimately decides whether or not to grant the license. Whether they would grant it when a municipality is not recommended, I don't know. I don't know what that criteria is. I don't know whether they, they would or not, but um, it's not a local approval process. It's a local recommendation process. Um, step 14 is after the council's taken action, the court finishes the, uh, the approval form, and then 15 is that we inform the applicant that the <coughs> material has been completed, they can pick it up and they can take it to the Liquor Control Commission. So the, the policy issues for further discussion um, will be how many, I, I mentioned to you there's at least 55 licenses available, potentially available right now. Um, these are what are called redevelopment liquor licenses. There are licenses for a number of different types of things, like a, there's a brewery pub license, and our, our police chief is, was an unable to be here tonight. He's our expert, I don't know if you refer to him, and he's usually sitting here helping me. But there, there are a number of different types of licenses. The one that we're most familiar with, I think, is what's called a C license. And that's a license where um, I purchase that and um, I own a business in town and there are a certain number of Class C licenses that are available on a per capita basis and I can take that license with me and I can use it in other areas if I want to. If I shut my business down the wall and I want to go to some other place, then that license is transferable. The redevelopment liquor licenses are not transferable. They're specific to the location and they're specific to the business. So the business could not move to a new location um, and transfer that license. They would have to apply for another one. Um, or if the business closed down and um, the 
let's say there's a separate property owner and they want to open a new business there, they could not use that same license because it's specific to the business and it's specific to the location. So that's one of the differences between the redevelopment and, and the Class C license. And so, rightly so, the holders of the Class C license will say, well, you know, if you have too many of these things, then that I see that Class C license as an asset in my business, and these can devalue the value of, of my asset. And um, they could be right there, you know, maybe not, I don't know. You, know. you don't know the value of that asset until you actually sell it. Um, uh, but there is a potential there for too many of these really devaluing the, the, the Class C um, license. How many is too many? I don't know. And I think that's the policy discussion that perhaps um, we have with, with the Planning Commission, with um, the DEA, with uh, the City Council, that um, you know, the greatest thing may be that we're all of a sudden flooded with these applications because we have a lot of restaurants that want to locate in town. You know, that would be a good thing. Um, but at what point is the market saturated and should we be setting um, that in policy or do you just allow the market to, to dictate that? So that's a, that's a policy discussion. <laughs> So are you saying the, the rest of the liquor license businesses in town are Class C? And it's yes. just those two that are that? Yes. Okay. And we are actually also um, uh, over on the number of Class C licenses that we could have per capita. So for example, if somebody that has a Class C license decided to move out of town and then they wanted to move their license back. Um, I, I think what I've heard the chief say is that they wouldn't be allowed to do that because you're limited on a per capita basis um, on, on that number of licenses. You mentioned about notification of, of the businesses because somebody else would be obtaining a liquor license. Do we do that, adopt that with any other businesses? Uh, you know, so I, I don't know what, I don't know what the fairness is if somebody wants to open another auto dealer or something like that. I mean, where, where, do you, where do you draw a line of when you have to notify them? And is, is it for everybody? I, I just don't know that answer. I'm just asking yeah. as a general question. Yeah, it, it's. I'm not aware of any other notifications that we do that are like this. Um, I, I, I was a little concerned about opening up this can of worms of, you know, as things come before. In fact, I got a request today where somebody said, you know, we want to do a welcome to all kit for new businesses. Can we be notified when a new business comes to town? And I, and I said, well, we can talk about it internally, but we don't always know. Sometimes we get it word by word of mouth. Um, sometimes they come here for a site plan review and, and you know, those kinds of things. But, um, you know, if it's, if it's a business that's opening where an old business used to be and it's the same use, then I don't think they need to come for a site plan review. So we may not know about it until all of a sudden the, you know, the sign goes up. Sometimes even if they are required to come to us, we don't know about it until the sign <laughs> comes, goes up. So yeah. yeah, I mean that was yeah. that was something I thought about. You know, are we opening up this or are we creating this slippery slope? I don't think it's gonna get out of hand. Um, but, uh, yeah. And I don't see 55 I, restaurants open in tomorrow or you know, 10 years. And, and the chief and I had a discussion about, I said, is it easy enough for you to be able to just keep a list of all of the liquor license holders that we have right now? I mean, I think it's, I think it was maybe four that are class C and then the two developmental, I think it's six. Um, that's that overly onerous on our part. So there's basically two ways to get a liquor license in town this way and then go to the liquor, liquor, liquor control? Um, everything has to go through liquor control. control. We yeah. guard it. And, and everything, um, I'm going to make this blanket statement, but as far as I know, everything still requires some recommendation from the city council. Um, so even like a brewery license may not necessarily be a redevelopment liquor license, but um, it, I believe, still has to go through some kind of a process um, to come to the city council and then have some kind of local recommendation. Okay. Um, I think even, um, I know there are uh, 
we used to see them at the, at the county. I haven't seen one here at the city yet, but sometimes there are those temporary permits. Yeah, for, uh, say, yeah beer can or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've seen those come before the county board of commissioners. I, I don't recall seeing one come before the council before, and I don't. Not that I ever been up here. Okay, the council members here recall that ever happened. Maybe, maybe it does. Yeah, once or twice. Once or twice. Yeah. 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 Quite often, the events that we see in town are um, somehow connected to one of the businesses already that have a license, and so they were able to just use their existing license to sponsor, co-sponsor this event. So the seventy-five thousand dollars is not that business doing rehabilitation to the building. Yeah, it is. Oh, it is. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so if I want to redevelop and get liquor license, first of all, I have to be in the DDA district. We're talking about item three. Mm -hmm. I have to, I have to be located in the district. I have to expend or at least um, a test that I will expend at least seventy-five thousand dollars for rehabilitation or restoration of the building. So I've got to, I've got to invest in this district up, um, at least seventy-five thousand dollars. And then I have to have a seating capacity of not less than 25 persons. That 25 persons is um, being discussed. Um, I, I think I've seen where they're talking about maybe 50 persons, maybe changing the state law or something's going on in there. And so I'll certainly update our process to reflect over the state law. How, how does that work when somebody was in there and they just did a $100,000 renovation in the last two years, move out, and the next guy comes in? How does he justify spending? Seventy-five thousand dollars on the renovation when he could use it for the same purpose. I mean, you're yeah. not going to do that, though. That's that's a business. No, I'm just yeah. saying. I mean, yeah. so right, right. That would make that property maybe a little less attractive for them. To exactly. Yeah. Hey, hey now that two buildings done, right? Yeah, but it's right. empty for twenty years and does us no good. Right. Yeah. So I, I I just think it's a little bit of both evils and yeah. You know, it's nice to say you know I. I I'd love to see a building continue to do it, but if it was for that intention, it's, it's, that's a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Open for discussion, that's what we're doing, right? Yeah, exactly. So that's that's the process. Um, I guess I was assuming that you would want notification. If you don't, tell me, but I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know the notification hurts. Um, you know, I think it's good to keep the planning commission in the loop, and and, and I think there will be a point in time where um, we may want to uh, um, engage in that policy discussion. Um, but I think it's one of those sort of planning commission, DDA council, you know, somehow joint discussion maybe about what's what's the limit. I mean, there. There, there may be a limit, although some people might say, just let the market drive it. Maybe we don't settle in the whole coin. Yeah, I mean, I think you, if you're going to open a business, you're going to have to do the research to find out, you know, it's a viable. Exactly. Well, that, that's why I think I'm not sure that I'm, I'm on board with notification of the police department, et cetera, et cetera. But to other license holders, I don't know what that does. I, I think it at least gives them the opportunity to, if, if they have some concerns, um, to attend a city council meeting or to, uh, maybe maybe they happen to um, you know, know whoever is proposing this business, they came from the other side of the state, but they were, you know, didn't have a great relationship with the community, they were in, in the other state, and so, they might know that and are able to bring that to the council's attention and to, to the police department's attention. Um, it it's another it, it's another step in encouraging public input, and those are certainly the folks that are going to be most impacted. Um, but it does get into the issue of well, then the local prohibition group wants to be notified too. I mean, yeah. you know, right? I mean, it is a big can of worms, right? But then or, you know, when O'Reilly's was coming to town, should we have notified all of the yeah, the three, um, yeah, all the auto parts stores? I mean, I, what what kind of slippery slope does that create? Mm -hmm. You know, again, I I thought about that. I'm not overly concerned about it. Um, you know, at this point. 
it definitely seems like the fad for breweries and all that stuff that's going on is, is, is over because then they're still growing strong and, and it's just unreal. Not just here in Michigan, but Wisconsin and other states too. It's just just booming business. I, I think we're going to see at least at least one more of this re of these requests. I wouldn't be surprised if we saw another two or three mm -hmm. after that. that. That would kind of surprise me. I say let them come and invest money in renovations. And, and they got to make their own business. Yeah, let their business decide. I mean, I don't know enough about the restaurant industry to say, oh, yeah, we can support X number of businesses. Yeah. I mean, that's their area of expertise. Uh, the Class C license holders are going to say they now have an unfair advantage because um, they, I, the thing that I didn't mention is that this, this license costs Twenty thousand dollars. The Class C licenses can be anywhere from fifty to sixty to seventy to eighty thousand dollars, or even more. Um, so those folks are going to say, you know, if you allow too much in in the, this community, then you're creating this this unfair advantage. Um, one of the things that the Liquor Control Commission requires, though, under these licenses, is that um, you have to show that you've made an attempt to purchase a license on the market and um, and that you attempted to purchase it at a fair market value, whatever that is. And uh, so the Liquor Control Commission goes through that. So one could say to the existing Class C license holders that, well, here's an opportunity for you to sell your license <clears throat> if, if you want to. So here's an opportunity for you to dispose of that. So maybe well, around Yeah, if you have a class C you own it. You own it so you get I mean it's valuable wherever if you get the this one then you're it's here. So it's less I mean valuable today, but maybe not five years from now. Yeah, this one. Right. Yeah. Right. This one is it it, it, it may cost less, but it's much riskier because you you cannot move it. You cannot take it somewhere else. Okay. No voting on that. No. Nope. That's that issue. Um, yeah. So then there wasn't anything in the packet about the zoning changes, right? I think that is the planning commission goals priorities. Um, there's a 2015, and then there's and there's eight items listed, and um, then there's a 2016. And I think as we're getting ready, I, I can't believe we're already thinking about next year, mm -hmm. but we're already thinking about next year, and we want to have some discussion with you, kind of like we did about this time last year. What what would be your goals for the next year? What are what are you know two or three things that you want us to to focus on. One that we've added under um, 2016 is what is considered to be a hard surface. And um, there's a, a requirement in the ordinance that parking lots have to be paved <coughs> surfaces or another surface approved by the Planning Commission. And the Planning Commission has allowed uh, crushed concrete, um, has allowed crushed asphalt, um, but during during the course of that discussion, there were some members of the Planning Commission who said, eh, you know, it's going to depend on the circumstances. I don't know if we always want to allow this. And, and the whole point of not having, we certainly don't want gravel lots um, because we don't want to create, um, you know, dust and, you know, all that kind of stuff. We'll be tracking things on the city streets. Um, but there does seem to be or did seem to be some support for crushed asphalt, crushed uh, concrete. What we talked about doing was perhaps having the engineers putting together some specifications and then bringing that to the planning commission, talking about those specifications, and then um, that would be what the planning commission would adopt, is those types of hard surfaces. And, and then we would have some direction of staff um, to know what the alternative to asphalt would be. Or you might say, we don't want any crushed surfaces. We want to stick with all asphalt surfaces. But if there are other things that you, you want us to, to gear up for and set a priority, then I think we'll, we'll want that. Um, 
that direction from you. And we'll start to put together then a uh, sort of a plan for 2016 and gear it up and address those issues you want us to address. I think I'd like to um, talk animals once again. We never came to conclusions about animals in terms of having a, you know, your 4-H rabbit or goat or moose, whatever you want to have. Um, I know that, you know, it's, it's pretty restrictive right now, but we had talked about maybe allowing something, and I think we should maybe, I think it's going to become more and more popular for people to want these things. I think we should kind of neaten that up. Yeah. Yes, I've seen more and more animals coming to town. Yeah. One of the things that's on here is um, it's number seven requirements for parking spaces. Um, we're, we're close to having a final draft of the downtown <coughs> parking report, and um, I'm pretty sure what's going to come out of that is a discussion with you about what the zoning ordinance requires in terms of numbers of parking spaces and, and maybe giving some consideration for um, the type of use and the hours that those parking spaces are actually needed. For example, for downtown residential, typically Monday through Friday, 8 to 5, those parking spaces are not needed. They're more of an evening. Um, whereas. Um, certain types of retail or certainly professional offices um, need those parking spaces during that period of time but not necessarily in the evenings um, you know a restaurant may not necessarily need morning parking depending on whether or not they're open in the morning but you know lunch and dinner evening parking is, is needed um, so we may bring to you once that report is completed um, at least some discussion Consider what you want to consider some ordinance changes that create a little bit more flexibility. And that one that's are we just looking at normal work days and, and not necessarily events? I don't know if we'll ever find enough parking when you're mm -hmm. holding the festivals that, that we hold yeah. during, during the course of this Saturday, Sunday, long weekends. Yeah. I think it's more an issue of, um, uh, you know. A business wants to move into a downtown building and um, the parking requirements for that type of business are that you have to identify 10 spaces. Mm -hmm. um, so where are those 10 spaces? Well, we've actually gone through the process of looking at every existing building <coughs> and what the parking requirements might be um, under the existing ordinance um, to see whether or not we have enough parking spaces, and we know we're already deficient, right. just with the way the zoning ordinance is written right now. And then as you project that out over the future and what the future uses might be, obviously we're deficient in that way as well. So do we know what that would be, the max, if every business was open and every store was yeah, open? Yeah, that's in that report. We have that? That's in, yep, that would be in report. It would be, it's a great report. Um, Did you write it? No, it's a great report. no, Williams and Works uh, worked on that uh, for us. And, and they actually um, had one of the, the guys that did the data collection, I think spent a couple of days okay. in town, you know, also looking on GIS, looking on, on the maps and things like that, but I think spent I think a couple of days in town. Every yeah. parking spot. It's in the, it's in the report. Yes. It's, it's going to be a great report for, for this town in terms of, especially for the planning commission. The uh, surface that just got done down by the cemetery, that, that's what's called crushed, Mark? Yeah, that's called a, a crushing shape um, without applying the asphalt layer on, on the top. Uh, we're, doing, we're doing a crushing shape on North Grove and, and High Street, and um, basically they have a machine where it comes in, there's a couple of types of milling machines. One is they mill the asphalt and then a conveyor belts up into a truck. Mm -hmm. The other is that they mill it and then lay it back down. And we knew we were going to have that machine in town for the North, North Grove High Street project. And so we got price from them to see what would it cost us to just crush and shape that section of North Washington. Because anything is better than it is right now. It's got pop on top of pop on top of pop on. And so the price was $7,700. Um, 
Uh, one of the things that we did add to it later on in the course of um, discussion was that they, they have a tank on that machine and they, they have the ability to add brine to the asphalt millings when they lay it back down. And the brine helps those asphalt millings bond together. Typically, you want to do crushed asphalt in the spring so you get the hot summer and that's what helps bond it together. We don't have the advantage of that right now, and so we spent another couple thousand dollars on the brine solution to, to help that. Will there, um, be, will there be a, a layer of um, tar going over it later on, maybe not this year, but hold that together? So, yeah, I, mean, I, I don't know how it holds or, or what the whole thing is. That, that's not my specialty, but yeah. I did drive down and it, it was much better to drive down. Yeah, I we think it's going to hold together for for some time. Um, paving that section is not in our five year right. plan. Um, it just off the top of my head, I, I I would think it would be within our ten year plan. We haven't gone out ten years yet. Um, the challenge up there is that the, the criteria we use on, on prioritizing streets is. Um, is it serving public facilities, schools, churches, things like that? Um, is it um, uh, is it serving like as a spur to a residential neighborhood like Sibley? You know, it's one of those where most of Valley Vista, um, that neighborhood will come down to Sibley and then shoot over to Valley Vista, Palm Street or Ridgeview, or, and um, so does it does it serve a neighborhood as a spur, um, or are there um, utility improvements um, that are needed in the street or you know, um, you know, how many residents does it serve? You know, as I guess I just mentioned is, is one of those criteria. Mm -hmm. Up there, that street doesn't serve a lot of city residents. I think there are maybe Well, so there's a lot of past citizens. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of township residents <laughs> um, up there. Oh, I'm talking about the people there. I know, I know. <laughs> it does serve public facilities. I mean, it does yes. serve the, the cemetery and the Boy Scout camp, right. so, so it hits that. It doesn't really hit the utilities. It doesn't really hit you know, you know, serving the businesses. So it's you know one of those that it, it's not a higher priority than Jefferson. It's not a higher priority than Suffolk and Howard, which are feeding the schools. Um, it's not a higher priority than Broadway in front of the post office in, in, in that area. Um, but as we start to, to take care of some of those, it's not a higher priority than Monroe. Monroe is um, one of the busier streets in the city. Um, but as we start to take care of those in the next five years, um, it does serve public facilities, and, and I could see it getting on the list. Now, one of the concerns we were proactive and, and we sent a letter out to all the residents up there, even the township residents. We copied the township um, supervisor on it. And we said, give us your input, tell us what you think. And it was about 50-50. Some said, it's better than nothing, please improvement. Um, the ones who were concerned were concerned about um, either the, the maintenance, that it would be harder to maintain and probably not maintained as often. Uh, there's a wet spot up there. They were concerned about the wet spot, which is really a more of a culvert issue and a culvert cleaning and, and blocking issue that, that we're going to look at. And they were also concerned that, well, gee, if we do this, you know, this is now temporary, and temporary has a way of becoming permanent, and um, we may never see our street get paid again. But I don't, I don't see that as the case. Um, you know, I see it as we've already done the base portion of that street. And now when it becomes a priority for paving, then hard work is already done. So. Okay. Moving on to any kind of staff information. You see the building reports during the building. A lot of activity. I hate to say it, I got some rough work done. Should he have filed a permit? Yes. Do so you want his name and number? <laughs> my name? Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I hired him, my, I'm sorry, I didn't see my name on it. Unless he didn't, it didn't make the list. Oh. I don't know what to tell you. Cascade Inspection Services, they require a building permit for that. Okay. Roof or repair? Repaired. Yeah, you should be talking to Cascade. I'll let him know. 
There's another new house going up in Highland Hills too. I haven't processed that one yet, so that's why it's not on the list. But we did just get that delivery the other day. Well, I was going to mention to um, the mayor spoke under public comment about the oath of office and rules of procedure. Uh, we, I think, did a pretty good job um, three years ago of updating the planning commission's rules of procedure, and we tend to have that on the agenda for your organizational meeting every January. Um, that sort of cycle that we try to do is. In January, you, you elect your chair and your officers, and you also review your rules of procedure and update those. Um, we we haven't done as much with our other boards and commissions, and we're going to start being more proactive in doing that with the boards and commissions. But um, you should have a copy of the rules of procedure for the planning commission, um, and maybe just make a mental note that a organizational meeting in January will be on your agenda again. So, have an opportunity to review those and make changes. Okay. Any remarks? I'm good. No. I'd just like to say that um, on behalf of the Planning Commission, our hearts go out to Jim Hall's family and his passing. So, thinking about that. All right. We adjourn or? We adjourn. Okay. 745.